Hello, my name is Miguel Resendiz. I'm a marketing professional, entrepreneur, and the host of this podcast, Midcast, a program where we discuss how to monetize your talent, ideas, and show examples of people who have successfully done so in the past. In this podcast, we aim to bring the best business and life insights to help you materialize your goals. An open mind will go a long way in this program, so fasten your seatbelts and get ready for the show. All right, so welcome back to yet another episode of your favorite podcast, Midcast. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to a fantastic motivational speaker, film producer, CEO, and space interpreter, Matthew Simon. Hola, Ma- hello, Matthew. Hello. I was about to say hello. hola, Matthew. Yeah, hello, Matthew. How are hola. you? Hola, como estas? Yeah, I'm uh, very good. Thank you. Um, I, I remember you speak Spanish. So how is your Spanish going? It's so bad, Miguel. It's so bad now after all these years. It's been, yeah. you know, because I lived in Spain. It was uh, 20 years ago now. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, more now. I think it's like 22. So it's starting to go. Um, so it was always fun having Spanish speakers on campus because I sometimes practice with all of you. But I think I need to just go back to Spain and spend some time there or Mexico yeah. or wherever, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you will find, you, you'll find yourself a little bit lost with uh, different types of Spanish around the world. I think um, yeah. even I sometimes, I mean, when I arrived in SFU, there were a couple of international students from Spain and they couldn't understand what I was saying. They were like, man, it's really difficult to understand oh, really? what you're wow. saying. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. I, we had to, co- we had to come to a compromise and then just speak, you know, regular na- natural Spanish. Um, so I wanted to, I mean, I've been doing some research on you and I, even though you, I worked with you in the past, there's really a lot uh, to get to know about you. And the reason I did this podcast is basically to do that, to get to know more about the people that are uh, significant in my life or have been significant in, in the past uh, five or six years, since, since that's the time I've been in Canada. And so, so I saw that you were in Sierra Leone and Uganda in 2004. Um, so what were you doing there? So I worked, uh, I worked overseas with an organization called Right to Play, and uh, it's a sports-based organization, with, you know, which if anyone knows me is, is a hilarious organization for me to join because I'm not exactly overly athletic. Um, mm-hmm. But I was looking for an organization that was, had a unique approach to international development. And this one in particular was trying to go to regions where children didn't have an opportunity to actually be children to have their own childhood and mm. provide sport and play opportunities for them. So in Uganda, we were in a, in a refugee community, mm-hmm. uh, mainly Sudanese refugees who were coming across because the Sudanese civil war uh, was still on at that time. There was no South Sudan at that time. South Sudan didn't yet exist. That borderline hadn't been drawn yet. Um, and then when we were in Sierra Leone, we were working more with, with uh, in an urban setting in the capital city of Freetown. And at that time, we were partnering with local community organizations that were already established. They weren't established by by the West uh, or by international organizations. They were already running locally. And we partnered with them in order to, again, provide sport and play opportunities uh, for youth. So, for example, uh, one of them was a school um, run by a woman named Esther Kanu, who I'm still closely in contact with. And what we did is provided uh, like physical education opportunities for them and like sports equipment. So they basically added like phys ed, you know, or PE to to their curriculum. Um, but yeah, that was that was all part of my co-op placement in my undergrad. That's how that all started. Oh wow! Uh, which so was an international. It, it all began in your undergrad then. So how did so you yeah, were in Toronto? Yeah. You were in U of T, and then how did how did this idea of taking an undergrad, you know, half, halfway across the world in Uganda? and you know Sierra Leone how, how did that came to reality well it was you know I, if we have to kind of go back a little bit but like originally um I my passion was in science and astronomy and I would always kind of hoped of being an astronaut hence the backdrop um but uh it turns out while I really love science I really love technology um, I'm terrible at doing science. So I love science, but I'm bad at doing it. I was, I was bad at mathematics um, mm-hmm. and, and my grades and math and stuff started dropping off as they got more difficult through high school. Um, so I realized that maybe that, wasn't, maybe that wasn't my strength, but I always wanted to be an explorer, you know, and I figured, well, if I can't explore up, then maybe I can explore out. 
And so I was looking for a degree that specifically had a travel opportunity attached to it. And that's how I ended up in the international development program. And at the time, I don't, I don't think I was really aware of a lot of the struggles globally. I mean, I grew up in a small town, you know, in Northern Ontario, I didn't, I hadn't really traveled much. Um, you know, and I, I had an opportunity to travel a little bit in high school uh, and I lived in Spain for a year. That was my first chance to get out of Canada and, and, and my small city. And so I had some notion of what the world was like, but certainly not like, you know, challenging regions of the world, like, you know, regions of West Africa or places being afflicted by civil war, both of them uh, that I worked in. And so that wasn't so much what drew me. I think it, it was a reason why I stayed in it, though. Um, and it was it was remarkable for me to recognize just how challenging it is for you know the day to day life for so many other people, like so much more so than I could have possibly imagined. And so then it was like, okay, well, how how do we make the world better? And I kind of forgot about space for a while because I was like, okay, well, let's let's turn our attention to our own planet. So um, I mean, I remember you often talk about the school that, that you helped found in Sierra Leone with um, with 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 this um, kind of she's your partner or like she's your business partner or some I don't know how to call it but she works with you in this school called um, it is I forgot the name um, something for women right like it's school for women or yeah it's the women in action development women project. in action yeah I forgot the, the, the yeah. name, sorry. But yeah, she her name is Esther uh, Cano, right? Esther Cano, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's where you met, that's when you met her. Um, in, in that yeah, that so you went actually to I've known that. Esther now for, yeah, so I've, yeah, I've known Esther now for a really long time. Um, when you think about it, like we, we met, I guess, wow, like almost 20 years ago now. Is that nuts? Wow. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, anyway, so when we, one of the things, it was just interesting getting to know, like, first of all, how, how intuitively she knew her own community. I mean, like, mm -hmm. um, she had grown up in Sierra Leone during a civil war. Um, you know, she was college educated. She's one of the, you know, she had the opportunity to do that uh, through organizations that had come uh, into Sierra Leone to, to, to try, try to provide basically entrepreneurial skills to young, young people. And she went on to use those skills to start her own school. The reason being is that most of the education infrastructure in Sierra Leone was completely wiped out during this, the Civil War. And so she was trying to fill a stopgap in between because otherwise they were going to have what they were called like a, a lost generation of young people in the country because the war had gone on for, you know, better part of a decade. And uh, so she, she, saw it, she saw it important to fill that space. And so the, when the war ended, she continued the school. And uh, it was mainly vocational training. And now they're actually doing things like electrical engineering and, and computer usage and that kind of thing. And um, so it was, I recognize that the amount of money that was spent to put me, it's like one person overseas for a year could have run her entire school for the same amount of time. So what's the efficiency there in terms of how we're doing aid work? Like, and also what's the value in having me there? Like, I certainly don't, have any more skills or knowledge about her community than she does. It's kind of like the savior mentality, right? And I, I think we've, I'm, I'm hoping that development kind of grows out of that. So we said it makes more sense to just raise money, tell her story to a wider audience that she might not have access to, and then just send it to her directly and let her use the funding, right? Rather than have us be over there because it just costs so much money. And that's, so that's what we do. It's a modestly sized organization. It's called Esther's Echo and it goes to support Esther. And uh, yeah, we, we typically raise enough money a year just to, to help the school uh, cover its costs and, and maintain operation. Yeah. So, so you're the CEO of Esther Seco, right? Uh, as, of, as of now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're not, a, uh, we say that I'm like, what it really means is that I'm the person who's in contact with her and trying to build up a support base. Um, you know, our donor community is pretty tiny. So um, you know, the CEO can be different things depending on the size of the organization. You know, we're certainly not a multi-million dollar uh, project, but I'm actually okay with that because um, I think that this, this might be kind of the future of how we're doing this kind of work. Um, people call it charity work. I don't really like the word charity, but um, this kind of focused community work because you can find people now because of the internet or, you know, because of, of the availability of global, tra global travel, people can meet these, these individuals around the world who are already doing incredible work. 
and you can share their work. Um, or even locally, you know, here in our own country, you can meet people now that are doing very focused, targeted work. So, you know, it's not the giant multi-million dollar institution where sometimes it becomes unclear as to what the work it actually is. You know, it, it sort of spreads out all over the place, but it's like people that are doing work in one concentrated area. Um, so uh, I, I don't, on paper, because we file the paperwork and are incorporated, we have to call it CEO, but I think of myself more as just an advocate. Uh, and really Esther is the one who's in charge of what's going on over there. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that's what I was kind of wondering because she's the one that's in there. She's the one that's actually running um, the school and stuff. So it, it will be interesting mm -hmm. to to know what the kind of relation with, um, between like you being the CEO here in Canada and her in in Uganda or in Sierra Leone. Um, when I was, I, I did a, f a few fundraisers uh, last year and when I was looking for, for a community to help, oftentimes I was really disappointed with um, how efficient the, the money was utilized by whatever organization I was sending the money to. And there were organizations, I mean, I did some research and there were organizations that were, that were using 20 cents of a dollar for every, yeah, you know, for every single thing that I send them to. And, and then that worried me. I was like, yeah, like this, this doesn't seem really fair. And what you're talking about being focused in one community and being a small kind of, um, it's an NGO, I assume. So being a small NGO that sends money to a focus community and just helps this, this uh, limited area, I think that's really good. And it brings me kind of back to my, some, some of my experience in FinTech that, you know, it basically democratize the, the openness of information technologies kind of democratize how we do things with our money now. And we don't, we don't settle for yeah. inefficient, inefficient bureaucratic um, processes that were basically part of the 20th century. Um, so, so when you send, when you send money, are you using like a fintech company, like, uh, like TransferWise or are you, or are you guys using a special method that, you know, can maybe facilitate other people to send, send money abroad? Yeah. I mean, like the organization has its own, like women in action has its own bank account overseas. So we, we basically just wire transfer it through the bank. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the only way to do it. There is, there is loss like along the way because banks will, will take their cut. Um, you know, but in the end, the money is still going directly to a community leader. Uh, and so I think that since it's in the hands of a local leadership and, um, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be as efficient as it can possibly be, uh, in terms of overhead, like, just to touch on that for a second, the, the thing with the thing with the overhead costs on on operating the charities, it's it's kind of arbitrary, right? Because we don't really know. There's no real like set number as to what the overhead to to a donation to a charity is. So some charities will advertise like we don't use more than ten percent. That's usually like a target number, but it's it's like an arbitrary number. Um, so I think in terms of efficiency, that for me, if people ask, well, how do I like who should I donate to? What if half the money gets gets used up, you know, along the way? Um, I would say like, well, what is it that you want the organization to have accomplished? Like, what's your, what's your expectation? Because some, some community development work is just really expensive to do. And so I would say like, don't, don't knock an organization just because it has to have, you know, 25, 30% overhead costs. I would say be more, be less trusting because it can't just articulate what it, what it has accomplished. Um, you know, and I would say in addition to that, um, that the story of the people doing the work or the people that are being helped by the work is not front and center in the narrative of the organization, but it's always like about the founders or about like, you know, like my story and with respect to Esther's echo is not really that important. It's usually just like, I met Esther and here, here's the work she's doing, right? Like, so that's the more important thing. And I, I think unfortunately, like the people that are being helped by the organization are sometimes too far in the background um, and we, we want to tell more like the hero story, like the person who founded the organization and why, mm. and like, that's not, that's not really as important to me anyway, or to us. Uh, it's really more about Esther. She's the one who started the school in the middle of a war. I'll never have to do anything like that. You know, um, the only yeah. reason that like, you know, I tell that story with her is because, you know, I can tell it to a wider and wealthier audience of people. Yeah. And I mean, uh, that's fair enough. And, and, you know, you're doing like, I think that's, um, that's true that a lot of people really try to put this cape on and say, oh yeah, I'm the hero or I'm a hero. You can see yeah. with people 
in Instagram going to, you know, uh, right now we call um, people in, some people in Mexico, white chickens is like a new term. So this is me okay. Mexicans that are white. So I'll, I'll kind of, I'll kind of fit in that category because not, you don't need to be completely white to be kind of um, white chicken, but you just need to be somewhat white. And basically sure. something that's describing this, uh, this segment of the population in Mexico is that they're going to like small indigenous communities, you know, like small towns and then take photos with, uh, with indigenous people. Just like, yeah. it's kind of weird. And, and then everybody's making fun of them. So obviously I will not do that. <laughs> um, I, I, I fit in the group just because of my ethnic uh, background, but I'm not sure. I, I don't have that culture actually. So <laughs> it is really funny for me to see, to see people doing that. And, and, you know, I really admire uh, the work that you do because you actually do something, uh, something very important for this community with what we will call maybe your privilege, right? Which is being from Canada, being able to speak English very well. Um, I mean, you're 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 a motivational speaker, and you're a speaker in general. Which um, I have to admit, is, your skills are really good. And since 2014, when when you gave us the the introduction to you know, what was that? Like it was just a few 101, or what? Or what was the lecture that you that you gave every yeah. year? People yeah. Welcome to welcome to school or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that was yeah, pretty good, I, man. I mean, keep thank going. you. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, it, it, it seemed like a, an opportunity that was too good to pass up because, um, you know, again, once I got an idea of what her finance, like her financial situation was like and how, how much good she was accomplishing, I was like, well, you know, even like when I first met her, I was still a student, like an undergrad student. And so when I got back before we had an organization or anything set up, we were just doing like fundraisers on campus. You know, we'd run like concerts and residents and that kind of thing and then like send funds over. And so, um, it, yeah, it just, it just seemed like it, it, like we could accomplish so much good uh, in partnership with her. Like she was accomplishing so much good already. And maybe we could just kind of give her like a bit of a boost, you know, because it's so hard to find funding over there sometimes. Or like um, the environment is just so unstable. Like after the war, there was always like the fear that war would break out again. But there's also environmental instabilities. Like in 2016, there was like massive flooding. Uh, there's been an Ebola outbreak. Now with COVID, uh, you know, so there's these huge challenges. And, you know, like there's, there's here, there's a lot of safety in place with the government. You know, if you lose your job, we've got CERB. You know, even in, co in comparison with other developed countries, Canada has, has done pretty well with that. Like, um, but over there like that's just not the case like the school will just close so right now if we hadn't had the fundraising that we've done this year um and which is more to say the donors that have, have helped us i i don't think the school would have survived it probably would have closed and that was because of the, the generosity of donors this year both through our website but also through our, our facebook campaigns yeah it is really impressive um it's really impressive that you know they managed to stay afloat and And you're right. Um, I mean, it is again like it is really noble that that people in, in here in Canada are looking to people have, halfway across the world to help them, right? And I really, I mean, I really appreciate that because I was listening to to a podcast yesterday actually uh, where they were talking about how easy it is for us to dehumanize uh, basically people that we never see or the people that we we don't. I mean, we cannot even imagine the conditions where they live in. And, and then it is very easy to sure. feel that our problems take priority, which obviously they do, because then if we don't fix them, then we die. But um, this person was talking yeah. actually about, <laughs> about um, a Colombian community where she went to. And, they, and this is a very poor community where they, get, they grew uh, coca leaves, uh, right? And like cocaine leaves. Okay. And, and then she says, look, like um, everybody's asking me why I don't, I don't call The, the DEA or something on them and you know so they get arrested and just like look they, they don't really know how their life work right and how uh, how these guys um, have to figure things out to get ahead because they are not like rich or they're not like the typical people that you see in the movies with like guns they're just like a family like a rural family growing growing yeah. wheat or something right or cooking yeah. sorry um 
so when I when I see when I when I imagine or when I try to imagine what people from from Uganda is going through, um, or people from Rwanda, for example, because Rwanda also had really tough uh, a really tough situation, yeah. then uh, the, I, I realize I cannot <laughs> I just cannot imagine it uh, how 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 hard it will be. So yeah, well, that thank you for sharing the info, and hopefully the people that listen to the podcast will. You know, donate. I'll put a link in the YouTube description, description, Thank so you. that people can send some Thank money, you. and I'll do that too in Spotify. So just you know, click the link. If there's a link to to donate, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do you guys have like credit card or do you guys accept credit card? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. It goes. It goes. Uh, our site right now is hosted on Squarespace, and uh, one of the cool things in Squarespace is that like they manage all that side of it, so it's all like secure transaction. Um, okay. If people. I don't know when this is getting posted, but if people find it before the middle of next week, they can also still find it on Facebook. So we also have our Facebook campaign um, and that, you know, actually shows like how much has been donated so far. Uh, so that's great. Um, if you just got to look for Esther's Echo on Facebook or just go to our, our website, which you can throw the link on there for and you can donate to there too. Awesome. For sure. Um, yeah, I will. I'll make sure that people don't need that. <laughs> I'll just share it. Uh, so now that, that I see your kind of your passion for education, because obviously you wouldn't do that if if you were not passionate for education, and then you combine this with your with your background in like science or your or your passion for science and space, right? So then, mm-hmm. so explain a little bit how this transition between you know graduating and then uh, working in 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 residence life, or why why did you decide to take on this job? And then now you are um, working, th- then you work for, uh, for science, uh, science world, right? And then now you're working for the, the, the HR McMillan, the oh, planetarium, HR, yeah, the HR McMillan yeah. Space Center. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things, I guess, like, I have a couple of big passions. Um, uh, my main, I guess, the thread that kind of goes through everything is really, um, uh, I, I have a love of life of, of, of not like living, but of like, well, I guess that's part of it too, but I, of, of like the life beings on this world. Like I really care about the earth. I care about people on it. Um, I, I think, I think astronomy. So my uh, love of space is a way to celebrate that. Like when we, um, you know, the, the main, the biggest question in astronomy uh, right now uh, you know, that kind of underlines everything that we're doing out there in space is to see like whether or not we're the only ones like us that are out there. You know, we're always trying to find new planets, the planets that we want to focus research on are ones that might be habitable, like Earth. Um, you know, we want to make, we want to reach out and have that connection. And I think as individuals, we do the same thing. You know, you're always kind of, you know, in, 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 in space, it's like, are we alone? Well, we do that. We ask that same question as, as humans ourselves. We're always asking the question, like, are, are we alone? Like, are people that understand us? Like, how do we reach out and, and make those connections? And connection can be really complicated. Like, if you think about, we got to beam signals, like, all the way through space. we got to think about how to translate it. You know, would aliens speak a similar language as us? Uh, you know, what would our ideologies be? Um, you know, we do that here on our own planet or even like just, you know, meeting someone at a bar. Like, you know, it's, you're always trying to do the same thing. You're always trying to reach out, like make connections, try to understand one another, whatever the setting is or how distant the person is um, or how different they are. And um, but I love I love forming those connections. I love helping to build a sense of community. Um, I feel like we do that through Esther's Echo. I feel like I did that when I worked at SFU because, you know, I was helping to supervise a residence community and, and build community there for people who come all over the world to come together. Again, forming those connections with each other, learning about each other's passions and interests and what to do with them. Um, and I feel like I get to do that through my, my passion for astronomy and space as well and talking about kind of the wider universe. And so I think when people say like, well, what is, you know, what is international development and like res life and space all have to do with each other? Like they all seem like very disparate interests. But for me, it's, it's all about, you know, opportunities to, to form connection and to, um, and to cherish those connections. Because again, like when we look out in space, we haven't found any other planet like ours yet. And so I think it, it's a reminder to us to take care of what we've got here because it might be super rare. And even if it's not, it's probably far between uh, to somewhere else. We can't just like pick up and go um you know and so it's that's you know we've we've looked around even to the planets in our own solar system it's possible there's nothing living on them not even microbes you know and so it's we got to take care of our planet we got to take care of the people on the planet life on the planet 
And so that's that's what I try to do. I try to remind people that, uh, you know, even so when we're going on trips to the planetarium, when I'm working at HR McMillan Space Center, when we get back to Earth, because usually I'm taking people on a whole trip to the universe, when we get back, I'm always like, take care of this place, right? You know, we've gone everywhere now, take care of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. So a quick question, what would you be more surprised um, to get to know for certain? That life is extremely common in the universe or that life is very rare in the universe? Well, yeah, at both, uh, there was, I, I think it was like Carl, I might be, I might be misattributing this quote now. It might be Carl saying, someone, someone talked about this. It was a great astronomer who talked about it and they said, like both answers are profound or regardless of what the outcome is. Like we find out we're the only life in the entire universe. That's astonishing. But if we also find out that the universe is full of life, that's also amazing. Um, I don't think in either way, it doesn't diminish the, uh, the value of life at all. Like, because when you think about it, like the process still is that, that uh, inanimate ball of just stuff that was our planet earth gave birth to animated stuff. And now we've been on it for so long that like that stuff, like the just stuff of the stars has evolved long enough to be able to study the stars themselves and know where they came from. That's amazing that we could do that with our brains, you know, um, that evolution has given us this ability to, to be able to look back into the universe and understand where we came from. Yeah, I, I have recently, uh, I think I have told this to, to a lot of my guests in the past, but I have recently been watching um, a lot of how we develop as humans and also how other animals mm -hmm. kind of develop, right? Because I, I really like to see the cruelty of nature because it reminds me that, you know, we're not in this fairy, in the, in this fairy tale where I'm entitled to live comfortably. So like, it reminds me that, that I am in a world that realistically can kill me in two seconds and that's it. So, so how did, I mean, how did our skills to survive the African savanna translated into our skills to explore the space and understand complex math? How, how did that come about? That's a good question. I, I, there are probably anthropologists that could answer that better than I could. But what I would like to think, uh, you know, is that it is that there is something innate when we are at our best as humans, um, that we are explorers, that we, we want to reach out and see what else is out there. That might be our proclivity to just find resources, to seek out resources. But I, I think there's, it's more than that. I think that we, that we again, it's, it's a desire to connect. I, I think for me personally, and not to speak on behalf of all of humanity, but um, I, think, I think exploration in and of itself is like an act of empathy. It's a way to try to empathize with, with others. It's a way to try to empathize with the universe or with nature. And I think it's also a way to empathize with yourself because I, there are times I've never learned more about my own self, uh, my own biases and, and interests than when I travel, uh, when I go exploring. Um, now, that being said, I think exploration can also be perverted um, and twisted and can be turned into things like the legacy we see, you know, working in Africa with colonialism Uh, it's more about planting a flag and about establishing borders and about control. I'm not interested in that. Like the parts of space exploration about going and planting a flag somewhere, that, that, that isn't of interest to me. Um, you know, because those places existed long before humanity did anyway. It's not like I discovered it. You know, it, it wasn't there until I saw it, you know, kind of thing um, is, is ridiculous. It's more about, uh, I think, the humbling aspect of it. Now, does everyone ex experience that when they explore? I, I don't, I probably not, obviously, from what we've seen of human history, but I would like to think that that's what we should strive toward. I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but I would like to think that when we left, you know, when we got out of Africa, that uh, some of it was in that spirit. Yeah, I mean, I think a little bit of the reason why um, exploration can get a little bit savage or difficult and, you know, It can, it can lead to, to a lot of problems is because of the uh, natural scar scarcity of resources, right? Um, I don't know if you, if you have mm -hmm. heard this story, but I mean, Columbus was not, not a, a good guy, but the guy that was even worse than Columbus, no. I think the, guy that, the, the guy that actually did a lot of damage to most indigenous people in the Americas was uh, Cortez. And I don't know if you, if you know who, who he is, but um, 
it is a divided opinion on on Cortez. Like some people say, well, you know, he actually uh, save a lot of slaves from the Aztecs because the Aztecs were also super cruel. But I think it all comes down, to, you know, what the Aztecs did to the rest of the indigenous people in, in, in Mesoamerica and what Cortes did to every indigenous people in Mesoamerica was um, that they didn't have the resources. I mean, Cortes, he, he didn't have a way back to Spain. So he had to, he had to build new, new ships if he wanted to get back to Spain because he burned them when he arrived. It was a really, you know, a weird way to, to demonstrate that he was persistent. But yeah, he was like 20 years old and then he burned his, his ships. He's like, I'm gonna stay yeah. here until I, until I conquer. And he did well uh, at conquering, but he did really bad at making, uh, keeping um, the new Spain or what uh, is now Mexico in, in a good condition. So. Do you think that our kind of proclivity to try to survive and to try to live and provide for our younglings um, generates this maybe savage way of, you know, exploring, you know, like maybe not a sympathetic way of exploring? Because right now what we're experiencing is that uh, you can travel to Europe in a plane in like eight hours and sleep in an Airbnb for $20, eat in a, in, eat in a small it's a small shop or like five euros if you're in Europe, right? And, and yeah, it's, it's just kind of simple uh, the way we do it now. But back in the day, uh, if, you didn't come, if you didn't come back with something, your head was on the table, right? Like the kings of Spain or the kings sure. of France will kill you. Um, so how, how do you think, like, do you think there's a way to reconcile how people explore things before and how we're exploring things now? Um, and then see maybe that uh, our, that was just part of our human evolution and now it's time to move on to, um, to a much better way of, of doing things? I, I would like to think so, yeah. I mean, um, even now, like we have, there are competing forces in terms of, uh, um, well, not necessarily competing, but there, I mean, there are different streams of space exploration going on right now. Some are publicly funded. You have some that are privately funded. Um, most, I, I don't know if in the public sphere, there's a lot of like concern about private space exploration. I'm one of those people that I am, I am kind of concerned about private expo uh, space exploration. It seems to be what's leading the charge right now. And it's doing like an amazing job at developing new technologies to get out there. But then like, it's already strange enough to plant the flag of another nation on the moon, uh, say, or Mars. But what if it's the flag of a company? Like, what does that mean then for space exploration? And and honestly, I, I, it, does that democratize space? Like, is that is that leading to more democracy? Um, and I'm not sure because there's no rules around this right now. It's like space is kind of the wild west when it comes to exploration, um, and we haven't done a really good job, I think, of catching up on on laws. Like uh, one present example right now is that SpaceX is launching um, all these new satellites in orbit in order to provide like internet around the world. That's actually in one way is super good because it means that some communities have never had access to the internet or can have access to it now. But it also has been obscuring telescopes from doing research. And there are a lot of astronomers that were concerned about that, but there's nothing to really stop SpaceX from doing it because there's no, no one owns space really. Um, and so it's like, we, I think our laws need to catch up with this a little bit. Um, and, but, Maybe what it all comes down to, um, Miguel, you, you kind of, you brought up this point and I, I don't know if this is a way to kind of address the question, but you, you brought up the point of scarcity. And I, I've been thinking about scarcity a lot lately, especially like this is kind of a nerdy thing for, for, for science fiction in space because there's, just, there's always this idea that eventually a society will reach a point where it's post-scarcity, like with that it's managed to figure out energy generation or the management of resources such that scarcity isn't really a thing anymore. Um, and I think we're kind of at that, we're getting to that point actually, because I almost think that now the idea of scarcity is kind of propaganda that's used to control people. Um, because when you think about it, I think it's really hard to convince people that scarcity still exists in the world when we have like more and more and more billionaires. And you're like, well, could we just like, if we set up a taxation system that was in place or talk about distribution of wealth and resources, there's enough to go around. Our planet is still ecologically capable of supporting the population that we have. 
but yeah, we throw out food and we let people starve to death. And so it doesn't yeah. make any sense given the amount of wealth that's in the world and resources that, that we still use scarcity as like an argument as to why people should have to die uh, when it doesn't, you know, that, that to me doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, when it comes to wealth, I mean, I don't know if you, if you have heard um, in the news, like breaking news, uh, Elon Musk lost $2 billion in, um, in Monday. Sure. So, so then you hear that and you're like, what? Like, how did he lose them, right? But um, something yeah. that really helps me kind of rationalize this is that that's money that doesn't really exist yet, right? That, that's he, it is like if I tell you, okay, how much are you worth because of the things that you have? And how, and how much value yeah. some places on those things, right? So, for example, it, I was I was actually doing some research on this, and um, even though Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the, uh, on earth at the moment by sure. you know his net worth, he's actually not as liquid as a lot of other people. So there are a lot of a lot of other people who actually have more uh, cash available to them, and the reason for that is because. Um, if, uh, if Jeff Bezos decided to sell all, all of his wealth in Amazon, his wealth would actually be worth much less because nobody will want to pay so much for so much, for so much equity on Amazon. Um, just because it will just scare investors, right? If Jeff Bezos is getting out, why? Sure. Like, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of value uh, that's in place in here. And then I think there's a lot of just estimation because right now the value that we give to his to, to his equity in Amazon is based on the scarcity of the, of the, of the availability or like, yeah, based on the availability of, of equity in, in being sold for Amazon. So uh, I'm kind of, yes, I agree that there's a lot of wealth and there's a lot of um, food to be distributed around for people to actually live a decent life. But at the, at the, end, at, at the end of the day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take millionaires money as the measure for that. Because a lot of that money is unrealized. It's just money that is being estimated. And that money is not in the market and is not being spent. So that money is really not contributing to, to the market. Um, now, I, I think we are nearing this point that you're talking about, about just crossing, uh, you know, post-scarcity and being able to be so efficient that can I, everybody can, I, can, have can I pause you on that for a second? I want to respond to that point though, because I think it's an important thing yeah. to talk about. So what, what's interesting about this is I always find is like, when we talk about the wealth of billionaires, they always want to be like, oh, but that's not, because I've heard this argument, right? It's like, oh, but that's not real actual money. But then why do we treat them as if they have it? Like, why do these people still have that much political power and influence over our society? And, you know, and so it's like, we're, we're wealthy when we want the power, but when you start talking about like taxation or like the extreme amount of wealth, and it's like, oh, we don't actually have that money. Um, so I feel like this is a bit of a it's a bit of a cop out because when we talk about people who don't have money, like the impoverished, they definitely are told you don't have money. But when we talk about the wealthy, and they're like, oh, we actually don't have that money either. It's like, okay, but wait a second, like the amount of the the energy there of whatever that wealth is, yeah. however it's calculated in the billions of dollars, yeah, yeah. it still has political clout, political influence. It still shapes like the credit, what the access to opportunities that they have. But if you want to tell me, hey, money is imaginary, let's not put a lot of like uh, a lot of uh, stock in that. Sure. Then let's just get rid of it entirely. Let's find out a new way to do society. Yeah. Right. So it's like, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. But at the same time, like we still treat these people as if they have those billions of dollars. So if they really don't, then let's not anymore. Right. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I'm, I've heard this argument before, but then it's like, OK, but you still have that kind of influence in society. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. They still have billions. They just don't have the billions uh, available that they think they have or that people say they have. So like, yeah. I must, like let's say Jeff Bezos sure. has probably around $20 billion available for him to spend or like, you know, invested in some sort of liquid it's just, uh, it's assets. pocket change. <laughs> yeah, like he, yeah. Probably, he, he probably work with $20, million, $20 billion at the moment. I don't know. And that's enough to buy you enough political yeah. cloud because then you can buy the Washington Post and then you can buy other stuff, right? But- Oh, for sure. We, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, if you had a hundred million dollars, you still have a lot of political cloud, right? So like, you don't really need billions. Oh, definitely. Cloud. Yeah. Um, so no. the point, no, the, the but point that I'm trying to make is uh, when, when we talk about, it is not about not taxing them. I mean, for, for me, I, I think we need to tax them. For sure, and even I think a lot of them believe that they need to be taxed uh, more harshly. 
But um, sure. what I what I'm trying to 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 bring this point to, or like how to like the reason why I think this is relevant is because this wealth a lot of the times is just very it's kind of imaginary. Like the the because we did yeah. we are <laughs> talking about the value that we put on their companies, right? So like yep. Tesla, like the Tesla became the, the most the most valuable car manufacturer in the world because of the technology that they own and 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 how good they are at, do, at doing what they do. But they are actually smaller than Ford, and they are I mean much smaller than Toyota, which is the second the second biggest. They 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 don't this they they are not able to meet their backlog as soon as soon as any other car manufacturer. And so like when we talk about um, the, the real value of their wealth is just kind of relative. It's, I think a lot of people just jump on the hype. On the hype, like I'm going to give you an example. Marijuana companies in Canada became very, very valuable two years ago. I mean, everybody was like, "Wow, like let's buy this," and then they realized that they still couldn't compete with the with the uh, black market in Canada because the black market didn't pay taxes. It was right. lower quality, it less regulations. So then the investors were like, well, this is not a good investment. And then all of that wealth that was imaginary became to a correction. And then now they kind of understood what actually was uh, the real value of it. So I do yeah. agree with you that, that right now, for, right now, what I will counter this or what I will, what I will use to support your, your, your claim is more about the technological development. You know, how we can now provide Ooh. more vitamins in rice, I mean, GMO, I, a lot of people are against GMO, yep. but I, I, do, I do support GMO because I've seen, I have seen actually how a lot of people in my community in Mexico uh, benefited from that, right? Because then they were not yep. um, deficient in vitamin A or vitamin C because they were eating GMO grains. And in a way, I, I really appreciate that. And that's one of the things that I don't know if we will have. Um, yeah, I, I don't like Monsanto, but you know, there is always some some good that we can see out of it. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, like, and so there, it's it's a combination of both these things. So it's like, like I would push your argument even further. Like you were saying, okay, the wealth of these companies, like it's imaginary. Well, all wealth is imaginary, right? We we have just decided that this is like that we agree that this is like currency and how it works and this is how we're going to do everything. Um, but if it's imaginary, it's not imaginary to someone who's starving to death. Right. Cause we'll, we'll always say that that person doesn't have enough imaginary, whatever in order to, to eat. Um, so it's like, for me, like when I look toward a future civilization, so let's go back to young Matt who, you know, grew up like watching Star Trek and stuff. Cause that was like, you know, one of my big inspirations for why I'm into astronomy. It's also a reason why I do my work with Esther Zeko because, you know, when shows like that, they would travel through the universe and they would try to do good where they could, if possible. Right. Um, and so I'm, what I'm thinking of is like, what's the point of all the stuff that we've done, like all this civilization, you know, all this work, um, if we can't figure out how to make sure that people are fed or, you know, that their basic rights and needs are being met. And I think that we can do that now, you know, through some of the, like through the example that you just provided, like whether it's, you know, it's genetic, genetically modified food, um, the medicines that we have, but it's also making sure that we don't still have what I think these arbitrary reasons in place as to why some people should have and some people shouldn't. Um, and I, I just, I'm thinking now, especially like, I think there are the success of generations that are coming in, don't have as much faith anymore into the rationale as to why there are have and have nots. Cause like the reasons are, are usually pretty weird. Um, they're sometimes based on as arbitrary as like, well, it, you were just born in this part of the world or because you look this way or because, you know, so like I, I am looking toward a future planet, you know, where, and this might be utopian, but you know, we have our basic needs yet met and we also still get to do stuff like go and explore and, you know, have this kind of self-realization, whether we're personally get to explore or we get to explore as a civilization and head out into space, um, you know, bringing with us things like genetically modified rice so we can survive the journey. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to, you know, and I'm, so I'm, I'm hoping through all the work that I'm doing that it's building toward 
you know, that kind of future that we that many amazing writers and science fiction authors and, and show creators and producers have, have tried to show us that we that we could do and I, I think we can do. Um, if there's one technological thing coming up that I'm really excited about, um, if we get it to work is fusion power. Um, so right now our nuclear power on Earth is created by fission, you know, we're taking heavier elements and splitting them apart. Uh, but in stars, like our sun, we take uh, lighter elements like hydrogen and we fuse it together. And if we can make that happen on our planet, it's like pretty clean, cheap power forever, basically. You know, we can run our civilization just on like water, you know, taking hydrogen out of water and, you know, and, and you can run like thousands of homes off like a liter of hydrogen fuel for like a year. It's, it's, it's amazing. So if we could, this is one of those steps toward like a post-scarcity society that I was talking about that I think about in my head. But, and there are people like around the world that are putting a lot of effort in trying to make that kind of technology work. So I, I, I listened to, to those news actually over the radio. Um, so China is doing that, right? So China is working on that. Yeah, I read about that recently, um, but I mean, there are efforts to do that. We have like, we have a fusion reactor, experimental fusion reactor right here locally. There's one in Burnaby. Um, what? <laughs> so there's the Costco that's at the, yeah. So it's called General Fusion is the name of the company. And it's a Canadian uh, answer to, to uh, fusion research. And it's, so it's based out of uh, Burnaby. It's at the base of, of Burnaby Mountain. Basically there's a Costco like right around like in Burnaby and it's like, like right behind that Costco. So. Behind a Costco in Burnaby, there's like, they're trying to create baby stars, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so, but there's also, I think the largest one in the world is still being built in France, uh, oh, okay. if, I'm, if I'm correct. I think it's one of the largest engineering projects in the world. And how, how dangerous is fusion um, in comparison to fission? See, that's, like... and that's one of the things, it's actually a lot safer um, because uh, with fission, all the fuel is inside the reactor. And once the reaction gets going, it's, it's actually fairly complicated to shut down. You, you know, it's, it's a matter of like putting control rods in and absorbing neutrons that are flying around all over the place from broken atoms. Um, whereas like in fusion, you're, you're injecting fuel pellets, well, depending on the type of fusion, but um, the reaction is, is easier to close down because it's just a matter of like basically not adding more reactant into the reaction. It's kind of more of like a combustion engine where, you know, fuel is being injected into the, into the engine, if, as soon as you shut off the fuel supply, the engine stops. So it's it's a lot more like that. Um, and so it, it technically, and again, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is that it is a much safer form of, of reaction. If we can get it working, the problem is that containing the reaction is really difficult because it, it's very hot. Like we're talking like tens to hundreds of millions of degrees. Um, and so right now it's, it, you can't have a contact at any surface. So it needs to be contained within a magnetic bubble um, and unfortunately, as far as I understand, the problem is that containing the reaction right now takes more energy than the reaction actually makes. So it's, we don't really quite have it energy positive yet. That's very interesting. So I, I want to bring this back a little bit to your passions, because uh, I think um, one thing that I'm trying to convey with this podcast is that people manage to actually live off their passion and to, and to sure. kind of reach their goals, right? And uh, I always... Thought it was really impressive what we were what you were doing with chasing Atlantic. Uh, so mm. I I mean I watched a lot of your interviews with all these great personalities in Chasing Atlantis. And and sure. one thing that I couldn't avoid to notice is that the difference in time between these interviews can I mean the gaps of time can be quite big. So like sometimes you have interviews from 2014 and then sometimes you have an interview 2018 mm -hmm. or something. So tell us a little bit why i mean that the chasing atlantis thing started as a as a trip to florida to see the the last space shuttle right yeah okay. yeah so uh it was just like this little side project um mm -hmm. and uh it started it was like it was a bittersweet moment because i recognized that like i always wanted to be an astronaut and this was the last flight of the space shuttle, which was the iconic vehicle that astronauts took to space as I, you know, through my childhood. I'd never seen a launch and I, I wanted to see one in person and I wanted to bring as many people with me as I could to, to go down and see it. And so first I thought, okay, well, I'll just book a whole bunch of cars. I'll ask all my friends, we'll all get together. We'll drive down to Florida, we'll watch the launch. Um, but then I realized like, actually the best way to do this, I think would be to record it. That's, that's how I could bring the most number of people with me. 
And so I partnered up with my friend, Paul Muzzin. Uh, he's the founder of Riptide Studios and a filmmaker. And he said, like, well, let's get like a proper camera and like do this right. So uh, I had no like expertise in making a film. I had no background in it. Like I had never really felt a shot like a movie or anything like that. But uh, Paul had all that expertise and knew how to set lights for an interview and everything like that. And so, so we had it down and we shot the trip down to Florida. And for the heck of it, I said, you know, I'm going to send an email to the Canadian Space Agency and see if they if they'll let us interview somebody like these, you know, these two kids coming down from from Canada to watch the space shuttle. And they said, well, we have Chris Hadfield if you want to talk to him. And we were like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, he's, this is like one of my heroes. He was my hero <laughs> astronaut uh, when I was a kid. And one of the reasons why and that I really loved Chris is that he he talks about that that connection between being an astronaut and his view of humanity. So like looking down the fragility of the planet and the, the need to care for it and, and, and making those links. And I, that's, you know, if I ever had the chance to go, that's, that's kind of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. So I, I really appreciated that in him. It wasn't just about the technology. It was, it was about the humanity of it as well. So all of a sudden we came back and we had, you know, we had the footage of the shuttle launch of our trip down there. And we had this interview with Chris Hadfield and we thought, well, maybe, maybe we could do more. And so we started interviewing more people and, and the project evolved and we realized that it was less about the space shuttle. It was less about the legacy of the space shuttle, which is what we thought the film would be focused on. And it was more about how do you reconnect with a passion from your childhood and bring it back and make it a part of your life again? Because I was, I was pretty far out of touch with space at that point in my life. Um, and we also like so, and we so we started talking to people more about that it was about like how do you how do you keep that childlike sense of wonder and curiosity about the world and keep it with you um especially as adults i would like to think and this again might be might be stretching this idea but if we maintain that maybe we would have more of those people that are that are willing to travel through the world with that kind of wonder and humility and less conquest and conquering you know um and so it's that we had been interviewing people. You asked like, why basically, why is the project taking so long? Because part of it was, I was like, I had no idea what it was doing at every stage of it, you know, it was learning. Um, but I also just, I didn't want to rush things because I was, I was learning and growing myself. Like I still wasn't sure what story I wanted to tell. Um, I, I hadn't quite made up my mind yet. I wasn't sure um, who I wanted to talk to yet. And, um, and then toward the end, we also realized we wanted to diversify the cast a bit because I, at first, when we went back and looked at the footage, it was all primarily the same uh, demographic. We're talking like uh, middle-aged enough white guys who had like had worked in the shuttle program or worked in Apollo. And we said, hey, like, let's, let's diversify this group of people because if we're going to talk about themes of connection and belonging on our planet, then let's represent the people who are connecting and belong on our planet. Um, and so, yeah, it's taken a long time. Some of it was like just running out of money partway through, uh, you know, but we've had a lot of support and, uh, and, and big donors that have been helping us out. Uh, but yeah, it has been almost like a lifelong project now, almost 10 years, but I think we've kind of gotten to the point now where we have the footage and the story that we want to tell more clearly. Part of that is like figuring out my own values over the course of the last 10 years that have been refined by asking the same questions to people over and over again. Um, and I hope, fingers crossed that it gets done this year. <laughs> that's that's sort of the plan and that it'll be released this year, which will be the 10th anniversary of the launch of the, the final launch of the space shuttle, which is Shuttle Atlantis, hence the name Chasing Atlantis. So my favorite video in, in all of those interviews that you have uh, on YouTube is when you ask Bill Nye, who will win in a match? You or, you or uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? And he was, I mean, he was like, yeah, yeah, in a wrestling yeah. match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who in, in a wrestling match? Yeah, he's like, match. I'm built for speed and, and Neil's, Neil's built, for, based for, built for breaking things. He's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Neil is like um, the Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, he's so, a big guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, he was, a, he, was a, he was a football player in college. Was he? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, that makes sense seen... that why Bill would answer that way. Have you seen his uh, his photos as a college student? He's like a ripped guy. He's no, big. I gotta, I gotta look yeah, that yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look him up. He's nice. he's like like one of these stereotypical guys from this from the football team. And yeah, so See, one thing I wanted. That's to not me. That's why. That's why it was <laughs> funny that I was involved in a sports organization in Africa when I mentioned. I was like, that. That's not me. But yeah. 
Yeah, well, he uh, he has a really interesting background, and I really like his. Um, I really like the way he looks at things um, for most of the time. And actually, when I was working in Germany, he was kind of one of the pinpoints that I used to bring myself back to North America or something because um, okay. I was listening to his podcast. Uh, he has a podcast. I forgot his, the name of the podcast. But, yeah, Star Talk. Uh, I think it's called. Star Star Talk. Yeah. Yeah. And. And sometimes when you're in, in Europe, it, it can feel a little bit alienating, uh, alienating from, especially if you are really not from Europe. Um, and then my closest thing to a European society will be Mexico, actually, because can, Canada is very different sure. to European society and Mexico is a little bit closer to it. Um, yeah. But then I kind of miss Canada, you know? I was like, oh, I really miss Canada. And then I used his, his podcast while I was in the gym to, to bring myself back to to feel like I'm in Canada or in, or in a North American society. And, cool. and the way he talk about, about, I mean, he, he has a very, a very interesting perspective that I think you also share, which is um, he, he sees, I think he takes away the simplicity out of things. And then he goes very deep into, into why space is important for us and why uh, we are trying to, to, we're trying to understand these things. Because one, one question that he often answers that I really like how he answers it is why do we spend so much, so much money in, exp in space exploration when we could you know, be yeah. using that money to solve hunger in Africa or in Latin America or anywhere else, right? And yeah. I always find yeah. that that's not mutually exclusive, right? Like, I mean, there's enough for both. The only problem is that the money that's supposed to go to those communities is just not going to those communities. Uh, but space exploration is yes. not taken away from those communities, I, I think. And, I, and, and he goes into much more uh, deeper um, points, such as the, 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 the technology development that we have right now comes from space exploration, you know, for, from that investment a lot of the times, because GPS and everything yeah. kind of came from there. And I mean, Gal Galileo even, uh, he he got funded and he and he he um, and he got to develop the telescope because he made it a, a a military tool for for the people in in Venice to actually be able to see when you know far away. So yeah. my my point is, I think the way you're the the way you're actually perceiving space and the way you're communicating is really positive because you have you have this film that we haven't really got to talk about. But when, when I remember you describing it, I mean, I was impressed because the resiliency that it takes to keep a project alive for 10 years. Uh, I have had a few projects that I haven't been able to keep alive for more than a year. So I imagine how hard it is. And especially because it is not only you, it is you and, and, and this other person, right? And yeah. he's the director or you're the producer and he's the director. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so Paul's, Paul's directing and, it, and so that's, I. Paul has an amazing eye for stuff. And so like, um, you know, I'll be out, we'll be walking around or whatever, like the space shuttle. Cause once we actually got private time with, with the space shuttle Atlantis, when now that it's up in display at the Kennedy space center, uh, they gave us a couple hours and then, you know, I'm walking around, I'm sort of talking and Paul's pointing a camera at me. And so I can't see what he sees, but then afterwards we'll go and we'll look at the footage and I'm like, he has these amazing angles and anyways, I'm, I'm so excited to share the whole thing with people. I'm also dreading, like I'm terrified of the editing process, which we, you know, we've, we've dabbled into over the years. Like there's just, I feel the weight of so many, like we have almost 500 hours of footage. Um, you know, we've interviewed over a hundred people. Um, so I don't know if it's going to become more of like a series, but there's, there's so many stories and, and amazing things that people have shared with us that I, I feel uh, the responsibility to to honor, and I don't know how to do that effectively quite yet. But we're going to try. We'll really try, um, and I hope I, I'm really encouraged by this, uh, Miguel, because what it means is that, uh, despite it, you know, not being like a released project yet, that even just in the interviews we have posted online, that it it, it has spoken to you in a way that I hope it speaks to other people. Um, yeah, you know, about about exploration, about space, and you know. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, for me. Like it just really speaks to to your passion, actually, because as I said, like not a lot of people are able to to, to keep a project alive for ten years, and especially something that they are not really comfortable with. You know, you're not you were not originally a filmmaker, 
and now you are a filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> I, although probably, uh, as you said, I put it in quotation struggling. marks. It's not out yet, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you're but you're already you're you're already taking the steps to finish it, right? And there's a lot of things that you that you're learning in the process. So the, I think the the joy is in the process, or the the important parts of the of the project will be in the process. It is like kind of like the the bone marrow, you know, the bone, the thing from the outside. It is important, but the marrow is the good thing, uh, especially. I mean, if you're vegan, so probably not, you don't wanna know anything about, uh, you know, you don't like this analogy, but that's the bone marrow, I think, of the project, just getting into, in, uh, deep into the journey. Um, you, you recently, I mean, yesterday, actually, you shared an image that it was like, if I live in, in the Star Wars universe, obviously I will want to be a Jedi, but given my experience as a public speaker and that, and, and draw towards ratios, lost cost, causes, I'll probably end up in, in a more of a Bill Organa role. I'm cool with that. Yeah. So, um, some can swing Saber, few can swing a Senate. That's a really cool, that's a really cool pose. When I saw it in the morning, I was like, yeah, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's a really- Yeah, I was so, like, this is like a middle of the night ramblings with myself. I'm like, oh, just like, before I went to bed, I'm like, I had this thought, I'm gonna post it. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to uh, to bring it a little bit to the sci-fi thing. What are you more a fan of? Sure. Or which one, which franchise do you like more? Um, Star Trek or Star Wars and, and why? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I, I really enjoy both of them. I don't know if that's a cop-out answer or not. I think like mm -hmm. if, if you could think of it in terms of like a polyamorous relationship, I'm like married to Star Trek, but I have like, I'm allowed to have a relationship with Star Wars sometimes. <laughs> um, and like, so Star Trek, Star Trek raised me for sure. Like I was, um, you know, that was, that was the show that for me was, it spoke to my values, what I, I hoped or imagined humanity could be like in the future. It's one that um, had overcome the differences on the planet. And as a result had, I think in a way, earned the right to then go out into the stars. Uh, because it had it had been able to harness the resources and the ingenuity of our entire planet to go and step out into the universe and become part of and actually help to create um, a galactic a community of people in the in the United Federation of Planets and uh, you know it's it's a society that again was post scarcity everyone had their needs met there's no more poverty no more war no more money uh, you know it was just like let's let everyone be their best and pursue their passions, unshackled by, you know, the concerns that we have on our own planet now, which I arguably, I say um, that driving people with the threat of poverty is not actually super motivating or efficiently motivating. I think it just makes people feel burdened. And uh, so let's go do that. Now, so that was, that was Star Trek. In Star Wars, um, I, I loved the personal dynamics there because it was really, Star Wars is about family. Um, and so I, I always loved that part of it. And I love that in both, uh, space is kind of the backdrop to tell these stories about connection, about belonging, about growth, because, you know, it's, it's that frontier where we can, we can kind of like open up all the doors of possibilities to tell these narratives. Um, so I don't know, to simplify it, I think Star Trek is a story about humanity growing up and going to find its place in the stars. And Star Wars is a story about individuals growing up and going to find their place and their family in the stars. And so depending on what, if I want to feel like the more academic or emotional side of that, I'll throw on one or the other. Yeah, I, I have, unfortunately, I was not able to, to grow up with Star Trek and I haven't really been able to be captured sure. by Star Trek. Um, I think it is a very generational thing. You know, people from a certain generation kind of... It might be, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's um, new Star Trek now. So I think it's there to yeah. to reach out to like a, a, like another generation of people. So it might be worth checking out. And certainly Star Wars is back now. And they made that announcement like two days ago. Yeah. There's like going to be 10 new series and movies and all kinds of stuff. So there's always chances for yeah. people to engage with the stuff. So like for me, uh, I'm a... I, I'm not a fan of Star Wars, but I really, I, I like Star Wars. So I wouldn't say I'm like a fan, you know, I'm, I'm not wearing, I, I don't have a lightsaber lying around in my house or anything, but I'd love to. <laughs> uh, the thing that I really yeah. like about Star Wars is that it, it, really, it really shows 
um, the good and the bad of our, of our nature as humans, right? And it shows kind of the worst in, of our nature as humans and it, it shows the best as well. So like when, when, when you look at Darth, Darth Vader, right? Uh, I think his character is so powerful because he was, he, he was at some point the, the very best of the best in the, in the good side. You know, he was the promise for all the Jedis and all the Jedis were people, I mean, were, they were like saints, right? And he was yeah. the, guy, the guy that they were putting their hopes on. And then all of a sudden, he, he goes to this other side, you know, the dark side. And, and he is also the best or the best of the worst, <laughs> right? And then the yeah. Alpatine guy who is the emperor is putting his hope on him. So he, he's been in both sides. And what I, what I really like about, about, about this transition is that it reminds us, that, or it reminds me, that no matter how, how much I ignore the fact that I can be evil, uh, the, 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 the fact that I can be evil is there. So like, there is, there is room yeah. for evil in everybody. Even if you are the, the guy that, that everybody's putting their hopes on because the other side will also put their hopes on. And the, the other point that I really like about, um, about Darth Vader in, in particular is that people are not evil for the sake of being evil. Like Darth Vader became evil for very particular reasons. And, mo- and one of them is because he felt, uh, he felt cheated, right? He felt cheated and he felt alienated from his community that he, that he cherished since he's a kid. And I mean, his family was also kind of messed up, right? Like they, these guys, like these nomads killed his mom, his mom and uh, his, his, loved, his loved one passed away. He doesn't know what happened to his kids. Um, his, his brother, quote unquote, you know, did a number on him. Yeah, yeah he lost a lot of his, a lot of his um, part, body parts. And then he's in a very uncomfortable suit <laughs> yeah. every day. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, if yeah. you read the comics, he's like super itchy, right? Like apparently he's just itchy all the time. And then that's why he's in a bad mood Yeah, uh, most of the time because Palpatine doesn't want him to relax <laughs> his mind and, and be a good guy again. So that's the way he's, he's yeah. been, uh, brainwashed. So anyways, uh, if you come, uh, like I, I cannot stop but to compare this empire in Star Wars to the Nazi regime. I mean, I think it is very similar in terms of like the fashion. Oh yeah, they, they, they're space Nazis. Yeah, no doubt, for sure. They definitely took and, a note from that yeah. in writing the series, yeah. For sure. And, and another point that I, that I find very interesting in that is that the clones, um, it really tells us that these regimes usually don't see you as, person, as, a, as a person, as an individual. Yeah. They see you as a, as a repeatable, replaceable thing that they can yes. that they can afford to kill because they have millions in their in their budget and i have always i mean to to my american listeners i have always found it incredibly hard to believe why you will want to join the army um in canada it doesn't happen as much that people join the army i mean i know people in canada that does join the army and i know people in mexico that do join the army but but in the u.s it, it is kind of like a thing that you want to do because you're you're proud of yourself but i don't I, I struggle to see the value on it. You know, you keep America safe. Yeah, how, how safe do you actually keep it, right? I mean, for the most part, you're keeping, you, you keeping people's bank, bank, bank account safe. So bringing it back to, yeah. to like the analogy of, of this good and evil that is portrayed in Star Wars. Do you think that the humanity is... is, is is running its course more in the Star Wars way or more in the Star Trek way? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. Uh, I would say right now, probably more in the Star Wars way um, because economics doesn't really play into Star Trek very much. Um, especially like when the, when the Federation has to deal with other uh, civilizations that still have like a, like a, like a capitalist based economic system, they still have to like exchange with currency or whatever. But within the Federation, there is no, there's no, there are no companies. It's actually like a, a thing to point out in Star Trek. There's no corporate logos. There are no companies. There's nothing like that. Um, Star Wars is the opposite. It's like a pretty hyper capitalist uh, galaxy that, you know, that, that they exist in. And they kind of bring that more to the surface in 
uh, the Clone Wars series, because like, um, and in the original, in the the sequel trilogy, and or sorry, in the prequel trilogy, and I guess also in the sequel trilogy now as well, they talk about war profiteering. You know, that they talk about the banking clan, they talk about um, the trade federation, and how like trade and banking and money is a huge part of the war machine, and that is true now. Like we've had so many warnings throughout history um, about the the military industrial complex, right? So the link between company and warfare and um, and unfortunately, uh, space exploration is wrapped into that, right? And and I didn't know the example that you talked earlier about Galileo, but that's like, I, I did not even know that that was a thing. But that's that's the truth of it is that sometimes unless there's a military application for some technology, we can't find funding for it. And that that is that is truly unfortunate. Um, so yeah, we seem to be more in that direction. I, I hope that we switch over and kind of go more you know, and this isn't to be anti Star Wars, because I love Star Wars, it's great. I think that your point is, is really good is that the one thing that seems to get missed, I find in the Star Wars narrative, is that the characters become, they come fully into themselves or capable of accomplishing their best selves, not because they avoid darkness, but because like you said, they become aware of the darkness that that is inside of them. Um, and so that's why I found like in Star Wars, I think the two most powerful moments uh, is when Luke goes into the cave in, on Dagobah and Empire Strikes Back and he has to face this like shadow version of Darth Vader and when he cuts the head off Vader and the mask explodes, it's his own face inside, right? Which is foreshadowing that him and Vader are, are related, which they reveal later. But I think it's also to talk about like that darkness that's inside of him that he needs to confront. Uh, and same with uh, Rey in, in, the, in The Last Jedi. She has to go down into that cave underneath the, the island on Acto and and face this dark reality of, about herself. And, and Luke is so like hesitant for her to do it, forgetting his own lesson. That, that's what he had to do too. He had to confront darkness. And so I hope that in doing that, we transitioned from a Star Wars reality more into a Star Trek reality, right? That humanity says, hey, we need to confront our darkness. We need to confront things like nationalism. Uh, we need to confront things like fascism. We need to confront things like unchecked corporatism. Um, and make a better society out of ourselves because otherwise we can become that. Um, and, you know, for me, like for a while, I, I, I kind of had the, uh, I thought about joining the air force for a while. Um, I would have not been good at it because I think, you know, I want, I was going to become an engineer. I wanted to be kind of like Chris Hadfield where, you know, he joined the, the air force in Canada. And that was one of the routes that you could go to become an astronaut. Um, but when I thought about it, I was like, I don't know if I could ever justify being in an actual military engagement. Um, I, I, I just don't know if I'd ever be comfortable with it. And, um, or ever feel like there was some, I mean, the, 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 the military has other purposes, sometimes humanitarian, but ultimately it is, it is a weapon. And so it's like, how do we get rid of the need for that? And when it comes to things like, like you were saying, why do some people want to join the army, like in some countries like the United States, I think that they, it is because of nationalism. It's seeing that the U.S. has, it's often called the manifest destiny, like police or control the world. I just wish that we all get to a point where we see the earth from the astronaut point of view uh, and see that, you know, the border lines, the country designations that we make, they're all imaginary. Just like money is imaginary. We just make these things up. We agree that there is something there. You're born in this country. That's what it's like when you cross this line. It's this place in the world now. Well, that all that is, is goofy. You know, we ultimately we live on one planet. We share its fate. We share each other's fate. And uh and hopefully that leads us more toward that Star Trek point of view. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think actually we're moving more towards Star Trek kind of society just because the way... I hope so, yeah. I've seen, <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I, I compare, you know, humanity in the 20th century and, and humanity now. Actually, I compare Germany in 89 and Germany now because I, I was there, right? And I was like reading the history of Germany and I couldn't imagine that in 89 they I mean yeah like for, for the most part in 1989 they were kind of I mean they were enslaved by the Soviet Union right I mean at least half of them and then the other half was not able to to do anything about it even though they wanted to so right now they are a much more much more progressive country and they do really care about their their citizens right they see them as valuable members of the community. Um, they, the fact that they have six weeks of vacation, that's crazy. And I mean, they, they have a lot of 
good benefits, insurance for everything. That's one of the things I didn't really understand, but they have insurance for, for, for your kids to, if your kids get lost, you have an insurance for that. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing. But the thing that wow. I'm, I'm going, I'm going and yeah, the thing that I'm trying to, to convey here is that even though we have a lot of, a lot of issues at the moment, I think as humans, we're realizing those issues and we're understanding them now. The only, the only, the only part of humanity that I'm worried about and that I, that I think can make us go more towards the dark side or towards Star Wars <laughs> uh, kind of society is the polarization of our societies. And mm -hmm. I, I read this quote, which says in a polarized society, dialogue is, or, is an act of rebellion. And that's one of the reasons sure. why I began this podcast, because a lot of the times I do think that people don't get the space to say anything or, or, or to state their point of view. So recently in the last episode, I had a, a person that actually was in SFU and then she moved from Canada back into Mexico to fight for the feminist uh, movement in there because they are actually, wow. you know, it's, it's pretty rough in there. And she, she was, she's in the process of getting her Canadian PR, but she doesn't know if she wants to do it or not because you know, she wants to really live there and fight there. And she also went to Uganda actually in her, in her, in her undergrad as, a, as, an, as an intern. Cool. And, and that's what I really like about people like you and like her and like other people that I have interviewed. I actually have interviewed another person that worked with NASA. Um, um, I interviewed him last week and, and he was telling me about cool. like the rock. Yeah, he's, he's landing things on the moon. That's his job to land uh, rovers and to land things. And, and, and you see that, you know, when you talk to them, all of them have a lot of similarities. I think we're more similar than we are, uh, than we're different in, in a lot of ways. Like, I think everybody wants to see sure. progress. Everybody wants to see equality. I don't, I haven't talked to anybody yet that, um, that believes that we don't, that we don't all deserve a decent life, regardless of, you know, of our backgrounds. And, and so what do you think, do, like, your your space kind of interpreter or or you're an interpreter at the uh, at the planetarium and then you do all these tours in in SFU at the Trottier uh, planetarium too. So how do how does sure. that reconcile with flat earthers and these movements that are really polarizing our society? And you know it look it, it is funny to to uh, to to hear that people believe in this in these theories. But they actually polarize and cause a lot of damage yeah. to our society. How does that reconcile? And how and do you think there's a way to approach them to convince them, or not to convince them, but to make them see the truth? Uh, I hope so. Um, I haven't. I don't know if I've successfully done that so far. I, I've engaged with a few flat earthers that have come uh, to the planetarium and also to the Trotje Observatory. Um, how do I, how do I explain it? Um, that is a great question. I, I, there is so much, there's so much I, that seems to be posted these days around um, conspiracy theory thinking, whether it's flat earth, anti-vax, like QAnon now, um, like all this stuff that's just, it's right out there. Well, just to, this is probably an oversimplification, but here's what I think of it. I think there, there are so many forces in our society that, that make people feel disempowered and marginalized and and disconnected and i think one of the the attractions to joining a conspiracy theory is that it does provide a sense of belonging and connection to a community of people that then have access to a special kind of truth and a special kind of knowledge and i think it makes you feel empowered um, and so i think it's a symptom of how people are trying to cope with the realities of our society, which is often very complicated and isolating, uh, especially now, especially now people are feeling isolated. It doesn't surprise me that in a very isolating period in our whole planet's history, that you have a rise of like the popularity of this kind of conspiracy thinking, because it, it makes a way for, for people to connect with one another. Um, so that would be my, that's probably an oversimplification of why it's happening. If, like, there are people that are, are probably more qualified to talk about how or why it's grown so much traction lately. Um, I think it's also a misunderstanding of how science works. Uh, there's this idea that like, I, I guess in a way science is an attack. 
I, th I think people can see it as in a personal attack against them and their own like ego structure and their own like personhood. Because if, if you look at sort of the history of science, especially in astronomy, it's this thing that progressively shows that we're less and less special than we thought we were, <laughs> right? So when we started off in the beginning, humanity thought it was like this, the, the, like this special creation by a creator at the center of the universe or like the center of our solar system. And then we found out, well, actually we're not um, even at the center of our solar system. And then we found out, well, we're not even at the center of our galaxy. And then we found out where well, our galaxy isn't even at the center of the universe. We're actually just like in the suburbs of an average galaxy among trillions of galaxies out there. And that we actually share genetic material with like a banana. So like, as far as life goes, like we're not that dissimilar from all the rest of life. But I don't think that that means that we're not important, like far from it. Because what's amazing is that in the midst of all that grandeur that is the universe, that grandness, um, we get to make our own meaning. Rather than saying that we have meaning just by existing here on this planet, um, but that through our existence on the planet, we get to create our own meaning, we get to create and form our own societies. And so I think, unfortunately, some people feel like science is a way to tell them that they're not special, um, either because they're not distinct from the rest of the universe, or that they don't have the authority to think about these things, that some scientist has told them what to think or what the answers are. Um, and so I think that in my job, you asked, how do I, how do I fight this? Um, I think my job as a science communicator is not just to show the answers or tell the answers that science has come up with, but also how science has come up with it, because that is a very communal thing. Scientists getting together, minds getting together, citizens, because we have citizen scientists now, like me. I'm not, remember, I'm not a scientist, but I'm a citizen scientist. I get to look through our telescope at the observatory, um, at the Trachi Observatory, and, and we've done science with that, with that observatory, um, and come to a consensus. And scientific consensus is a form of community. It is a form of belonging. It does bring people together, that they get to experience and discover something together about the nature of the universe. And so I think we need to do a better job in that, in saying that science isn't out to get you. It's not out to tell you that you're not special. It's not out to tell you that you're not smart it's a way to say like but it is a way to find truth and so we need to remember that it is true that trust the process um, trust the people that that want to tell those truths uh, and learn from them and realize it's it's that it's it's something that's beautiful i think there's a beautiful thing to that absolutely for sure one thing so when i was in school uh in high school i remember uh we were taking this class called the scientific method and most of my friends were like, oh, this yeah. is bullshit course. Uh, they were, this is, this is completely useless and I don't really like it. And I think I'm just wasting sure. my time taking it. <laughs> and I really yeah. liked it actually, because I was, I, I felt I was kind of in my space because I really, I, I understood it. And I have for some reason been really good at, at finding logic in things. So I'm not particularly scientific yeah. minded. So I, I'm not like uh, a scientist, but I, I'm interested in it. But I am I'm able to kind of understand it, and and every time someone brings up an argument about like for example, oh this is just a theory, you know it's just a theory that we share uh, genetic generic uh, or DNA with um, with a monkey, right? It's just sure. a, it's just a theory, and evolution is just a theory, and all of that is just a theory. And then I hear that from my mom, I hear that from from my grandma, I hear that from from people, I hear that from cousins. And one yeah. of the things that I often need to remind myself is that not everybody has been as lucky as me to, to understand that there is a, there's a particular method to, to, to prove how, how things work. And, and in general, I think sometimes what people go for is more, about, more of a name calling approach, like the Pro Arbles, for example. Like in 2016, uh, we saw that a lot. And, and obviously that was more directed towards Trump supporters, but it was also directed to, to people that believe in conspiracy theories and stuff like that. And although, sure. and that's when, I, that's when that part of the quote that, I, that I'm telling you about, an, uh, you know, an act of, of dialogue or dialogue is an act of rebellion, right? And I think this is where not, not dismissing people's ignorance is very important because then having, having this dialogue and bringing 
um, your knowledge, because honestly, we have a kind of privileged knowledge, especially you. You have a lot of privileged knowledge. <laughs> you, 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 you talk to, to Bill Nye, you talk to uh, Chris Hatfield, and all of this needs to transfer somehow. But unfortunately, so when I engage in, in, a, in Facebook, for example, and someone says, well, the earth is flat. And I say, well, look, there are these resources that say it's not. And then, and then the first thing that I hear from him is like, you're a shit. You know, he, he dismissed my, my, my effort to create dialogue. And I feel that that happens also in the other way around. You know, you're, um, you're a conspiracy theorist. Right now, it is a, it's kind of like a, like an insult, right? So, do you? Have, yes. I mean, have you, have you gone through that stage of name calling people and then being like, okay, this is not the way to do it, and then improving upon your way of communicating science? Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I do, I haven't called anyone names, but, but I've certainly been angry with people about their point of view and 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 have been dismissive. I I have done that, and that's to that's 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 to my own flaw, right? Um, uh, or fault. Uh, so, and it's it's not healthy. I think that I I. Uh, <sighs> I think in, that's my, that was my own reaction being caught completely off guard because I, I don't think I had realized how strongly some of these, these let's, I don't want to call them movements, but these communities had, had taken off. Um, and I remember I was caught completely off guard when one of them showed up at the observatory one day and it was quite, they were pretty aggressive about their point of view. And I'm trying to give a presentation to like 50 people that are inside the, the, the observatory and a person is, you know, is trying to sabotage the presentation to talk about how I'm like part of a grand conspiracy to hide the truth from them. Um, but they, they fervently believe this. So in their point of view, I'm, I'm the evil one. I'm the one who's like spreading mistruth. And so they're, they're coming from a place of, of righteousness, I think is recognizing that that is also, it, it's dangerous as well. Um, so it's like, how do you, like you said, how do you foster that place of dialogue? And I think, I don't, I've kind of given up on trying to have those conversations on Facebook because I don't, I don't think they work. I think that in order to have that kind of conversation, because remember you have to, you're shifting someone's entire worldview. Like they believe, like literally they think the world, the world itself is like a different shape, uh, which leads to an entirely different understanding of the universe. I don't think there's any witty comment or anything you could say on Facebook in a couple sentences that are going to change a person's entire paradigm. Stuff like that takes, a lot of time. So it's probably gonna have to be something in someone's, uh, you know, network of friends, someone they trust. Uh, it might be listening to dialogues like this, which I think is, you know, this is your motivation for doing it. I think that's awesome because yeah, it, like that in itself is kind of an act of rebellion. Um, and in the meantime, I just have to, I have to do a better job of empathizing. And so, like I said earlier, I think, I think people fall into these communities because they, they do feel marginalized. They do feel disempowered. Um, and they're looking for a place to reinvigorate that sense of empowerment and connection. Um, and part of it is then to believe, because I think conspiracies are designed this way on purpose, unfortunately, to make people feel like they're the smart ones and everyone else is a sheeple or stupid or, or whatever, right? Like, I, and so it's, it's, um, it's recognizing, I think, that that's, that's, there's a human part of us there that always wants to feel like we're connected to something that makes us feel important. Uh, my job is to make us feel connected to nature itself and that's that's what science does and i think that that's cool so it's just a matter of approaching it in a in an empathetic way well that's awesome um so uh one last thing that i'll i'll probably ask you to to answer is uh, if you if you could meet matt simone at 18 years old uh what will be the the first five things that you, I mean, the first five pieces of advice that you will give him and yeah, why? I've, I've come up with five, that's so many, yeah. uh, okay. Because I mean, because two is very little, three is kind of a weird number, five for me, that's kind of the, the sweet spot. Doesn't, they don't, you don't need to elaborate on all of them, but just, just give five wow. pieces of advice. All right. What would I tell my 18 year old self? What was I doing 18 at 18? Miguel, I was, I was in Spain. That's what I was doing when I was 18. What would I tell my 18 year old nope. self? Um, let's see. 
advice. I don't know if I'm even, I don't know if I've even learned enough yet since then to give that 18 year old advice. Okay. Here's a couple of things I would say. One, um, don't be afraid to fail. That seems pretty general, okay. but that's, that's a thing in my life that I always struggle with a lot. Um, is, is being, uh, not allowing myself to fail frequently yeah. enough. I think that's an important thing because failure is a step towards success. And I, I often would overthink things. I think it's another, if I were honest, Miguel, it's one of the reasons that our film is not quite finished yet. Um, and it's because I have a yeah. tendency to overthink stuff. So that, that definitely is part of the delay. So I'd say be more, <laughs> be more willing to fail, which is something I still, I tell myself still now. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. one. Secondly, I would say uh, write more. Right. Okay. Because I, I, I enjoy writing, but I wish that I had gotten more into writing earlier. And I wish that it was a skill that I had developed earlier in my life, which is connected again to the number one, which is being, not being willing to fail enough. So write more, mm -hmm. be willing to fail. Write more. Are you planning, Three. are you planning to buy, to write a book? I would, you know what, I would like to, I think eventually, I, I've gotten to do a lot more writing recently because I, I, in part of trying to find more work from home opportunities, I started working for um, a space science blog called uh, Universe Today, um, which is awesome because I've always, like, I, Universe Today ran an article on Chasing Atlantis when we first started, like, way back in 2011, mm -hmm. and then again in 2012 when we did one of our first fundraising campaigns, crowdsource fundraising campaigns for the documentary, and ever since then, I wanted to write for them. So it was kind of like always a dream to do that. And now I've come on board as one of the writers. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited. So I've written, I think, at least 15 articles since the summer. So that's that's been good. So writing has become more a part of my life now. And I, I really I enjoy that. But I should have started earlier. So tell my 18-year-old self that. Write. Uh, so yeah. fail more, write. Fail more, write more. Um, three. I would tell myself, don't don't rescue people so much. This is the thing mm -hmm. that I had earlier in my life. I always felt like I, I, I would always take on the need to try to rescue people a lot. Um, to take on all the responsibility of their, um, of their place in life. And like you were saying earlier, trying to don the cape and be a savior figure. Uh, there's a way to help be more of a coach, I think, in people's lives and less a savior figure. And I spent, I wasted a lot of time in my earlier life, trying to save people from, from themselves or from other things in life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should have spent more time developing and saving myself a little bit, I think. So I would, do you think that's why, be number three. do you think that's why you took on the role of an RA in U of T? And then subsequently, I think that your, it was, yeah, yeah. And then it subsequently you were, that, is, that is a very, that is a very good question. I would say that might have had part to do with it, but I think that I, I had to be aware of it lest it, be, it devolve more into that. But uh, yeah, there was there were times where I was definitely sometimes tempted to get over-involved in a, in, in a particular student's life, especially if I saw them really struggling, um, but recognizing that, that that is not always helpful, right? It's, it's more of uh, helping someone develop their own resiliency um, rather than trying to, to be resilient on their behalf. And I, I, have a I had a tendency to do that a lot. I sometimes still do. Um, and it, mm. it cost me a lot of heartache through the years. And so that would be number three. Don't feel like you have to rescue people. Help them, awesome. but don't feel like you got to rescue them. Okay, write, okay. write more, fail more, fail write more, more write rescue more. less. Yeah, rescue number less. Number four, let's see. Um, uh, I would have told, this is something I learned when I was working on the documentary, but I wish I, it was something I knew earlier. Um, don't confuse passions with dreams. Those are two different things. So wow. passions can lead to a dream. So my passion was space. My dream was astronaut. But when the astronaut thing didn't work out, I threw the passion away. I didn't think about the way that a passion could lead to a whole variety of different career paths or interests related to the same thing. I never, ever thought my interest in space would lead me to filmmaking as an example, I was like, how would those two things ever go together? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's been really cool. And, and also I think in the same way, uh, being able to do the work on the film, which led to then opportunities to write, to, to, to work at the observatory, to work at the planetarium, um, have led me to be able to do some of the things I wanted to do by being an astronaut anyway, which was really just talking to people about the marvel of the universe and how amazing it is and, and treating ourselves more as, as one world, right? Um, okay. So that, was, that would be four. 
Okay, so did you sh did you shift so, your dream? Oh, did you shift your dream? Then? Um, I th I think so. I I um, I think the next goals for me right now are like so in terms of space. Um, you know, I, I wasn't I didn't become an astronaut, but I've been able to do astrophotography. Uh, I've been able to talk to thousands of people about about stars. Uh, through the planetarium, thousands of youth about the stars. Uh, one of the most amazing things I've ever gotten to do in my life through the planetarium was to get sent into elementary schools around the province. We're not doing that right now, unfortunately, but to go around the province and actually bring a planetarium with us that we inflate in the gymnasium and, and project the stars and planets inside and fly uh, youth through space. And it's the coolest thing, you know, it's just, it's, it's an incredible thing. Um, uh, stuff like that. So I, what's next? I, I obviously am always looking for more opportunities to do more um, space outreach. Um, what I would like to do is kind of follow in your footsteps, Miguel, is to have a more regular show uh, that I produce myself. Um, so I don't know if that's going to look like a podcast or a YouTube series. It's actually partly why I bought this backdrop behind me was to, to maybe do stuff like that. So um, yeah. I would like to start producing my own content. So that, that's kind yeah. of the next so you, I mean, you have you have the Rolodex already with all these um, amazing people that are interested in space and have worked in, in programs uh, that go to space. And yeah, I mean, you definitely have the material and you have the skills. So go for it. I'd love to listen to, to what you have in mind. Yeah. So number five. I appreciate that. Number five. Okay. So we had fail more, write more, rescue less, rescue less. difference between passions and dreams. And number five, what would be the fifth one? I'd say um, go go easier on yourself. I know that seems like a pretty generic self help kind of idea too, but um, I maybe that's more linked. That might be linked as well to failing more. Maybe I'm cheating in that way, but I, I had a tendency to be pretty hard on myself um, for a number of years, especially after um, the the science thing didn't work out. Um, I spent I spent much of my life feeling like a failed astronaut than I did a successful anything else, you know, um, because mm. that first, that first dream didn't work out. Um, this is something I actually talked about quite a bit on camera with Paul when we were working on the documentary. Um, we actually thought for a while that the subtitle on the film might be the journey of a failed astronaut. Um, and, uh, you know, and then the kind of career shift or change in mentality that flows from that. And uh, that idea of, of, of being trapped on the ground and not being able to go up and, and just touch something that's right there. Like in, in almost every other passion on our planet, you can reach up and physically touch it in some way, whether it's, you know, if you have a, a passion for, you know, uh, etymology, like you can study the bugs. If you, you know, have a passion for ecology, it's forest, you can touch a forest. You know, with space, there are so many of us that study space, but very few people ever get to go there. There are less than 600 people that have ever left the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so it's, there's always kind of this, this distance from it. But, um, uh, and I, I always kind of, I think I always came down on my, my, on myself pretty hard for that for a while. So I, I would say just go easier on yourself and, and myself. And hopefully that translates to those five things can translate to other people or resonate with them too. But I guess, I guess that would be the five. Yeah. I mean, they definitely, I didn't think I'd come up with that list. So thanks for challenging me to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, everyone look, um, something I learned is uh, this is something I learned in university sometimes you don't sometimes if you think enough of a there's a problem as soon as there's a problem in your in your mind i think your mind starts working in the background already and then they start coming up so yeah you you and i'm pretty sure there's more than five actually but the, the but five i think is a comprehensive list of things that you could uh that you, that you could say right now kind of um uh, you know roll them out of your phone and just say them quick enough so Thank you so much for uh, coming to my podcast. I really appreciate the time that you that you have put into this. And yeah, thank you so much for really... for inviting me. I had I had such a great time. You're you're a, yeah you're an incredible interviewer. This is amazing. You're really good at this. You think? Okay. Well. Oh I yeah. Like that. these questions were. This dialogue was interesting. Like think of all the places we went in this conversation. This was really good. So I I can imagine it must be it must have been a treat for all of your your. Uh, uh, your guest to, to sit down with you. This is this is yeah. amazing. Thank you so much. I I really like to try to challenge a little bit um, my guests uh, with a few of the 
of the questions. So obviously not being rude or anything, but kind of, you know, bring this challenge to, to, to the logic. And I think, I don't know if I did it yeah. with you at all, but um, I was really, like, I, I have always had questions that I wanted to ask you, but since we had this, you know, kind of boss and an employee relationship, then I was like, yeah, maybe I should ask him when we are not boss and, and employee, because I just wanted to make sure that <laughs> my job wasn't addressed. <laughs> so, oh, that uh, would have never been a problem. Come on. <laughs> no, I know, I know it wouldn't be a problem, but uh, I just, yeah, you know, I'm from a, a society that has a lot of hierarchies, and usually you don't. Uh, you, that was ingrained sure. in me, but right now I'm getting more and more comfortable with uh, flatter hierarchies. And anyways, thank you so much. And to all the listeners, thank you for uh, t- taking the time to listen to us. And be, yes, you, I'm going to post all the links to all the projects for Matt down below because clearly he has a lot of them. He has Chasing Atlantis, Easter's Eco. What else do you have? What, oh, the Macmillan Planetarium, right? Yeah, the Space Center, the, the, the Trache Observatory, where we're still doing streams on Clear Fridays, which is awesome. So my voice okay. taking you through the universe. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Okay, well, perfect. So I'll post all of that, things that people can use as a resource to educate themselves a little bit more. And if they want to donate, then they can also donate. Awesome. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Have a good, have, have a-